Never before in the history of the world has a steel building collapsed due to fire. I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. True infernos have raged hot and long in steel-framed buildings, but not one of the buildings ever came down. In 1975, the World Trade Center's North Tower suffered a nighttime fire that flamed for three hours, spreading vertically from floor to floor. It burned twice as long as the fires of 9-11 without even a hint of a building collapse. In February 2005, the Windsor Tower in Madrid, a skyscraper undergoing reconstruction, sustained a 20-hour fire. This is what was left, a standing building strong enough to support a crane. In the days of old, blacksmiths heated iron till it was red and pounded it for hours to form it. Horseshoes, knife blades, and plowshares were typical creations. Steel was introduced in the mid-1800s, and by the end of the century, with the advent of the blast furnace, found widespread commercial use. A blast furnace is known as a controlled environment. High temperatures are reached as oxygen is pumped into a closed space. How and when does steel melt? Steel melts at temperatures of 2750 degrees Fahrenheit and above, attained only in a blast furnace or when a powerful incendiary such as thermite is used. Steel or any substance that is burned will never become hotter than the temperature of the fire or heat applied to it. An open-air hydrocarbon fire reaches a maximal temperature of some 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit in a dirty or uncontrolled burn, characterized by red-orange flames. Red-orange flames are what we saw on September 11th. Even the fireball caused by the plane strike was red-orange. A controlled burn falls between a dirty burn like a fireplace and a controlled environment, the blast furnace. A controlled burn employs a regulated mix of air and fuel, an example being your gas stove or the engine in your car. You can fire up your gas stove all day long, making soup, roasting a duck, or simmering a stew. Made of steel, your stove will not melt, and nor will your pots and pans. This is a kerosene heater designed for use in any ordinary house. The heater runs on jet grade kerosene contained in this tank. Made of steel, the heater can operate all night and all day. The kerosene fumes ignite and burn inside it, never causing even the smallest part of this heater to weaken or melt. You see how this debris is still smoking? That's when the fire is gonna still burn it. Eight weeks later, we still got fires burning. Okay, here we go. Molten metal in the basements of all three buildings. Right. And yet, uh, all scientists now uh, uh, reasonably uh, agree that the fires were not sufficiently hot to melt the steel. So what is this molten metal? It's a direct evidence for the use of uh, high temperature explosives such as thermite. Thermite produces uh, molten iron as a as an end product. Okay. We appreciate your coming on, even okay. if I don't understand right. your theories. Oh, okay. uh, we appreciate you trying to explain them. Thanks. Professor Jones barely got in his mention of thermite. An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit quite enough to liquefy steel. This is thermite melting the engine of a car. These core columns were discovered after the collapse. The angled cut occurs in exactly the manner that shaped charges slice through steel beams to control the way they fall. Notice the hardened once liquid metal. Was thermite used with the shape charge? 
The job of the shape charge is to cut steel H-beams. The way we do this is by cutting the beam at an angle, which through a series of beams cut at the same angle will tend to make the building shift over and walk. The steel in dragon-like lengths and contortions spoke for itself, bent, deformed, without cracks. Here is the meteorite, molten iron fused with concrete. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. It is true that heat expands steel. In a fire, steel members may swell and bend slightly. But this, how could these huge tangles have been created? The steel below the towers had melted at many thousands of degrees. Since metal conducts heat, were these twisted remains formed by high temperatures wicking their way through a gridwork of steel? Explosives also deform steel. As they fire, gas pushes outward. The force of the gas can easily bend a large steel column. Two kinds of debris, huge shattered columns that could break a truck, combined with matter that was near pulverized. You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. From 1996 to 2000, SecureCom installed what was referred to as a new security system at the World Trade Center. Wirt D. Walker III, a cousin of the Bush brothers, was CEO of SecureCom from 1999 until 2002. Interestingly, these facts have not been made public. Was it only a security system that was added during those years? or was it also the wiring for a long-awaited plan? Scott Forbes, an IT specialist in a firm that had leased space in the South Tower since its erection, reported an unprecedented power down in his building for almost the whole weekend prior to 9-11. We were notified three weeks in advance of the power down by the Port Authority. That was relatively short notice to plan to shut down all of our banking systems. It was a big deal. It was, a, it was unprecedented. We had a data center on the 97th floor. So our originating servers were all there. During that weekend, the power down meant that there was no security. Uh, the doors were all open, basically. And also the security video cameras were all off. But they were guys in overalls carrying huge toolboxes and reels of cables walking around the building on that weekend. Employees were notified that internet cables were being upgraded. Having worked overtime to get his company's servers back up, Scott took the day off on September 11th. As he watched the towers collapse from New Jersey that morning, he was sure this had been the purpose of the mysterious weekend work. Scott notified many authorities including the 9-11 Commission, about the unusual and lengthy power outage, but was ignored. Ben Fountain of Fireman's Fund spoke of unusual evacuations ordered at the Twin Towers during the weeks before September 11th. Others reported that the security alert was inexplicably lifted five days prior and bomb-sniffing dogs were removed. What would the dogs have discovered had they remained on duty?